Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you're listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds but we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one linda ryan linda qualified as a veterinary nurse in 2002 from general practice she then worked at two world leading university referral hospitals obtaining the diploma in advanced veterinary nursing medical in 2005 and in 2009 became a veterinary technician specialist in oncology and a member of the academy of internal medicine for veterinary technicians as well as her specialist interest in oncology Linda also has interests in analgesia, clinical nutrition, medical nursing, behavioural health and welfare, maintenance of optimum quality of life in chronically ill patients and clinical teaching. Linda's interest in training and behaviour evolved over her nursing career as she became more aware of its importance to patients' needs in their veterinary care. In 2012, Linda became a graduate of the Karen Pryor Academy for Animal Training and behavior and she is now proud to be a faculty member at the academy. Linda has since gone on to further advance her training and education in animal training and behavior and continue to study having credentialed for the examination for the veterinary technician specialist in behavior in October and she is about to embark on a top-up year for a degree in animal behavior and welfare this coming autumn. Linda owns and runs Inspiring Pet Teaching, which is aimed at pet and owner training and education, as well as continuing professional development provision. She frequently writes and pre- presents for the Veterinary Press and at CPD, Continuing Professional Development, events for vets, vet nurses, training professionals and owners. Linda regularly con- con- collaborates to provide course content and stage or teaching and reviewing for Karen Pryor Academy in International Cat Care, Fair Free, Encore EPD, as well as many other continuing education providers, both locally, nationally, internationally, and online. The Vet Trainer Connections and Patient Friendly Veterinary Practice is a passion which allows Linda to meld her veterinary nursing and behaviour knowledge for the benefit of patients, staff, and owners. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome one Linda Ryan to the show today who has been patiently waiting by. Linda, how are you? Hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for that fantastic introduction and well done with all the, the horrible acronyms and veterinary words. You did amazingly well with those. So thank you. And thank you for having me. It's, it's a huge honor and a privilege to be here with you today. The privilege and honor is all ours. And for those listening at home, I wasn't that successful. I had to do that. <laughs> three times. <laughs> Maybe we'll include that one in the in the um what do you call it? The bloopers reel. Because <laughs> there was some funny conversations going on there. Anyway, that was a beautiful bio, but we were talking before the episode, you've got something pretty exciting that you can add to that now. Do you want to just fill that in before we get officially underway? Oh, thank you, Ryan. Um yeah, I'm just really excited to have um got certified um, membership of the IAABC. So I'm now a behavior consultant for 
work canine and feline as well so yeah I'm really I'm really happy to have got that and um, yeah it's, it's a big honor it's a great organization and they're doing some great work so I'm pleased to be part of that too awesome well congratulations on that I'm doing a little happy dance for you here that's awesome and for all the animals and trainers that are going to benefit from that that's awesome and we will dive straight in to the first question today Linda could you please take us back to where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and some of the first animals you ever trained using it? Yeah, that's such a great question. And it was fantastic to be able to think about that because I, you know, I love to revisit that first discovery and remembering <clears throat> when it first came to me that we didn't have to try and be the boss or show our animals who was in charge. So I learned to train from my mum, who had zero knowledge and still has zero knowledge, love her to bits, but she has no good information at all about training and how to, you know, work with animals in a collaborative or, or you know, um, fear-free way, that's for sure. She loves animals very, very much, but she taught me that you had to absolutely let that dog know who was in charge. And one of her gems of information that she gave me when I first got my first dog, when I was my first grown-up dog, um, we've always had dogs, but my first grown up dog I got when I was about 19. He was um, a fabulous border collie called Jake or a borderline collie. He wasn't quite all collie. And she said, you know, you've got to have a chain lead with a leather handle because when he's, you know, out of line, you have to be able to use that leather handle to whack him across the backside. Um, so, you know, you don't want to use chain for that, but leather is perfect for that. Um, and another gem of wisdom was, you know, how to use a choke chain. So all of this came from mom, which probably came from her mom and none of it was what I would you know now if I thought about what I did in those days and I don't think I ever really whacked him across the backside with the leather handle and he was on a choke chain for a couple of weeks when I realized he would rather pull and choke than not pull so that didn't really work anyway but for many many years with with this incredible dog I was very much of the show them who's boss school and when I look back on it now it absolutely breaks my heart because I think there is so much more I could have done for him and I could have given him such a better life particularly in his early age of of you know growing up and adolescence and I you know I could have been an awful lot kinder and an awful lot more supportive and an awful lot more caring and I you know I shouldn't could have done better um, but, you know, I was never into beating him or anything awful, but, you know, I should have done better. So it was when I was a trainee veterinary nurse and I was working in general practice. And I, at this point, had a second borderline collie, Luca, who really became the dog of my heart. And he was pretty unmanageable. He would chase things. He would bark at everything. He would attack other dogs, bicyclists, joggers. I couldn't drive in the car without him barking continuously. I once drove from the south of England to the west of Ireland, which is a 500 mile trip. And the only time I had any peace was the four hours we were on the ferry and he barked the whole time. And so this dog had many, many issues. I got him as an adolescent and um, I had been trying all the show him who's boss stuff for quite some time. And I said to casually to one of our senior nurses in the practice, God, these bloody dogs, you know, grr, never going to get this sorted. They're a nightmare. And um, she didn't say anything, but she wandered off to her desk and she came back about 20 minutes later with this photocopied document. And it had obviously been, you could see where the staple had been photocopied and the pages had been, the, the turned pages, you could see the photocopy shadows of those. So this sort of six or eight page photocopied document had obviously been photocopied over and over and over and over again and had the staple taken out, photocopied and had the staple put back in again. <clears throat> And this document she handed me was called A Dog and a Dolphin, A Memo from Karen. And so she just handed me that and she didn't say anything. Um, so this was probably back in 2000, I guess. And I took it home and I read it and I just burst into tears. And I thought, oh, my God, there is. Oh, my God, this is amazing. We could we can interact with our dogs without using fear and force. We don't have to tell them who's boss. How about we just look for what they do right? Um, and I just was so overwhelmed with emotion after I read this little tiny booklet um, a memo from Karen and it was obviously Karen Pryor's little tiny little book that she had written 
and it changed my life and it changed my dog's lives. So from then on, it was positive reinforcement only for these boys. And within one to two years after, you know, five to six years of constantly, you know, feeling frustrated and frustrating them, clearly, we were able to change behavior in a way that I never would have thought possible. And we had the best relationship and the best friendship. And they looked to me for support and they trusted me and they taught me so much. So we just experimented with clicker training and we had a lot of fun and we changed a lot of unwanted behavior and improved their welfare and, and that for me was was life-changing and I had done this for a very long time with my boys by the time I went to Edinburgh Vet School and worked as an oncology nurse and so we'd hobby trained for four or five years at this stage my boys were getting on but they were having a great life and as I worked with the oncology patients so they would be coming in sometimes for you know every single week for chemotherapy when I took over the service and I inherited that service from it was it was not really a service when I, I kind of created it so the dogs that had been coming in for chemo week in week out would literally walk in the door and poo on the floor or they would be straining at their leads to try and get back in the car there were huge amounts of fear and resistance to coming in lots of escape behaviors and the cats were usually either shut down or really aggressive and difficult to handle and it had never kind of I'd never really made that connection between the hobby fun training that Jake and Luca my colleagues and I had done together over all this time that that could have any relevance to veterinary practice at all it never occurred to me and as I worked with the oncology patients over the first year or two of setting up the, the service there I just gradually learned to think a little bit more about could we use positive reinforcement to help these guys have a better experience how could we do it and I started off just by teaching them some tricks in the hospital and just having some fun with them so that it was a nicer place to be and making the kennel a really cool place to go and you get reinforced for that and you know we kind of gradually evolved that on to actually starting to think about training for cooperative care as I evolved my my knowledge and so it it really evolved from this clueless idiot veterinary trainee nurse who was showing her dogs who was boss to getting this memo from Karen and working with my borderline colleagues, Jake and Luca, to change their lives, to then turning it into a hobby, to then seeing the stress and distress that my patients were undergoing on a daily basis and thinking, gosh, I wonder if we could apply this in some way and change what their experience is like in the hospital too. And so that's, you know, there, I guess, the first patients on, on those two two different levels and, and for, you know, my, my own pets and my patients that I started to work with quicker training and positive reinforcement training and, and teaching owners about it as well. So, so helping patients owners to give them a better life. So for me, it started as a hobby and then it became a professional passion um, with all of those incredible animals who, who taught me so much. And I just feel so incredibly grateful to Helen Walker, if she's listening, um, to, for handing me that memo from Karen in the first place, because I probably still be wandering around in the dark ages if I hadn't read that. that that's a great journey. It's a, and you're, you're a great storyteller as well, Linda. I, I was imagining this document with the photocopied staple and dog ears in it as you were telling that story. So thank you for being a great storyteller. I love stories. Uh, for anyone that listens to this podcast, you'll know that. Uh, it must have been very stressful, I'm imagining, having this dog that you told us about that was barking the whole time in your car trip. Uh, and you said that it broke your heart. It breaks your heart now to kind of think back to then about all of the things you could have done with what you know now. And I'm bringing this up and I'm touching on this part of your story because it's something that I hear members of Animal Training Academy say. They've reached this point in their life where they've found positive reinforcement and they think back and they think you know, it upsets them. It actually stresses them out quite a lot sometimes that they've wasted all this time. Does that make sense to you? What, what advice might you be able to give or not to to people in, in that situation who are just coming across this stuff and reflecting back on their journey. Does that question make sense? It really does. It's a great question. And um, yeah, I mean, for me, yeah, when I think of, of what I could have done and what I should have done better for a long time, I would be genuinely very, very upset about it. I mean, it would bring me to tears, actually, because these animals, these dogs meant so much to me and I loved them so, so much. And sadly, they're both gone now. Um, 
but you know for a long time particularly after losing them and when I was in that grieving period they both I had them both until they were 16 and I lost them four years apart and I was you know during the grieving period after losing each of them I think it made it more intense it stung a lot more that oh my god you know the first half of their lives the first third of Luca's life I oh my god I could have done so much better I should have done so much better you know even through their veterinary treatment at the end oh I could have done better and I should have done better and I think it's we all you know so many of us have that experience where you think I could have I should have why didn't I oh but you have to say you know what I loved those dogs I could not have loved them more I adored them my heart was broken when I lost them they were my life and that was the case from the first moment I set eyes on Jake at six weeks old when I adopted him and Luca when I got him at you know a year and a bit I adored them from the moment I met them it wasn't that I didn't love them it wasn't that I didn't care it wasn't that I wanted to be unkind to them or that I wanted to not do my best for them it was just that I didn't know and I didn't have that information and I think sometimes it gives it gives us a a nice you know there are so many young trainers now and I thank god that they've never had to go through what we go through because they start off with positive reinforcement they never had to come through that painful crossover period and god bless them that's just amazing Um, but those of us who have come from there I think you just have to be kind to yourself and to say you know I would say forgive yourself but you don't have to forgive yourself because you didn't have that information you didn't know you were doing the best you could with the information that you had at that time with the limitations of your knowledge and skill there was yeah in hindsight you look back and you say yes there was harm but at the time there was no harm you didn't mean it and I think so many of our owners are in that position that we work with and it's very easy for us to go in on our high horse and go don't shout at your dog don't do that Mm, how could you do that that's cruelty that's abuse it's not they just don't know they don't have that information and it's up to us to help empathize and educate and I think sometimes having that background of understanding what it was like with your own animals or coming from that crossover point where you can actually empathize and you can use that to move forward and say I meant no harm I loved those dogs I now know so much more there was nothing differently that I could have or would have done in those days because I didn't have that information but I can empathize with people who've been in that same position or owners who are still in that position. And we can use that to move forward and to help each other. So I try not to judge myself. I try not to judge anybody else who's in that position. And I think in the world of positive reinforcement training, we're amazing with how we deal with animals, but often we can be a little bit punishing to trainers who use forceful methods or coercive methods or who don't use positive reinforcement training. And actually, I think we all need to look at look at ourselves, look in the mirror before we start throwing stones at people. So I think we all need to be a little bit kinder, a little bit more empathetic and and help each other reach out across and go, you know what? I was there once or I could have been there there, but for the grace of God and and just, you know, really use it to move forward, use it to teach, use it to learn, use it to empathize and and not be judgmental and not be unkind and, and not beat yourself up either, because what can you do? It was the way it was and and now we know better so that's kind of my take on it words of wisdom there be kind be empathetic and help each other out can't go wrong with that and potentially even you could view it and this might be far out there or quite different than how people feel understand that but you could use that as something to really help others out because you have empathy for how they feel is is that correct? That's, that's exactly what i meant ryan beautifully put thank you so much <laughs> for, for potting that because that's exactly what i meant <laughs> absolutely love it now i was going to ask you uh, to bring us up to speed and where you are now so let's 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 just shout that for a second because i want to, you to be able to share information about where people can go to find out about you as well and i think this is a good place to put it but we're going to just shelf it because you said something there which actually transitions beautifully to the next thing that you and I were going to talk about. And this was Helen Walker coming up to you. Did I get that name right, Helen Walker? You did. Helen Walker, if you're out there, thank you. This is when Helen Walker came up to you and handed you, was it called Dogs Dogs to Dolphins, was it? Karen Pryor's memo? It was called A Dog and a Dolphin, a memo from Karen. And think about what that did for your life (laughs) and now all of the people that you interact with and all of the animals that these people interact with so at animal training academy we call this ripples 
that would be an example of a ripple. Someone did something small and look at the ripples that flowed from that event. Now, when you and I were catching up a couple of weeks ago to talk about the subjects and the topics we wanted to cover in this podcast, we talked about ripples. uh, And you said that it resonated with you and you like to say this concept of spreading sparks. So can you just build upon this idea for us, Linda? What When you say spreading sparks, spreading sparks, <laughs> there's a, a tongue twister there. When you say spreading sparks, what do you mean? How, how does how does this for you relate to animal training? Um, and maybe give us give us some examples if you have any. Thank you so much. That's such a oh, I love the concept of ripples. It's just, it's perfect, isn't it? It's such a visual analogy, and it it makes so much sense to us. One little thing changes so many other things, but slowly and gradually, and in little tiny increments, and all of a sudden you've got a wave. So I love that. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I, I well, I tend to I speak a lot of on patient-friendly practice, low-stress handling, fear-free practice. So I speak a lot to the veterinary profession about this. And after my title slide, when I've kind of warmed up a little bit, I put up a slide of a massive bonfire. And it's an it's a incredibly startling image. And, and you can see these tiny little sparks heading up from the top of the flames into the blackness on this picture. And I like to kind of build this analogy, really, of certainly in the veterinary profession, we're very good at clinical work. We're very good at client communication. We have fantastic skills in so many areas of animal care and welfare. But we really don't get taught very much at all about animal behavior and animal communication and how we should apply that in our daily work as veterinary professionals. So I love to to kind of think of this idea as, you know, I don't want to come in here and give you all the information now because that's going to be overwhelming and we only have, you know, two hours or six hours or whatever it is we've got to talk together. We've got a couple of hours together and a lot of this information might be new to you and I don't want to overwhelm you because, you know, I'm overwhelmed by it. I feel like I know nothing half the time. And so let's talk about, you know, how about we start a little fire? How about we just start a little bit of an inspirational thought, which if you're going to use your fire analogy, that could be an ember or a spark that just springs out from the fire. Like, you know, when you've got your log fire on in the evening and a little spark flies out onto the carpet, you know, we can take that spark and we can take it elsewhere and we can start another fire with it. And of course, if you're not careful, you set your house on fire if you don't keep an eye on those sparks that come out of the fire. But the idea really is that you might not take everything from this and I might not be able to tell you everything of course because I don't know everything but if I can just inspire one little piece of information that you think oh my god body language or oh wow just slow down or just anything that you think maybe we should think a little more about behavior in a holistic way when we're dealing with our animals one tiny thing and if you go out and you take your little spark and you look after it and you hold it in a container that's going to keep it alive and it's got enough oxygen so it's got enough care and then when you take it to where the place where you want to start that fire and you tend to that little ember and you blow on it and you give it fuel eventually it's going to turn into a little flame and if you really work hard that's going to turn into a big fire and potentially you can build a bonfire you know and so tiny embers of inspiration I think can create sparks of desire to change things even in one little tiny area of what you do and that can create fires of passion for positive change change and we can create a conflagration if we want to and that can potentially burn down some of those old ideas and useless information that we're holding on to um so i just think there's you know there's there's little you know we, we want to use what we can in terms of analogies um to try and make it easy and simple for people to understand and and not blind with science but just create little sparks of inspiration that will change things in their mind and they will take that forward and change things in other people's minds and and change things in what they do and how others do things. So I don't know if that makes sense to anybody else, but it kind of makes sense to me. I love it. I love the little addition there of burning down old ideas. Uh, and <laughs> I love you saying in there that you feel like you know nothing. I feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do, right? We should. <laughs> and so Helen Walker gave you a spark. Is that right? She definitely did. She definitely gave me a spark and she's 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 created a monster who goes around <laughs> burning everything. <laughs> <laughs> and and so that spark's turned into a little little miniature sun burning on fire. Right. And- flying around, whizzing around, <laughs> burning everything down. <laughs> Absolutely. I liked your little disclaimer in there about people being fire safe at home. So thank you for that. 
it's very important. So for the people listening, do you, in your experience, have you found that people are wanting sparks when they're learning about this stuff or they just want to go straight towards being a miniature sun? Wow. Well, I guess, uh, who knows? Everyone's an individual, right? And everybody learns differently. But I tend to find, I have to say, when I'm speaking to veterinary nurses, particularly, they all want to go out and be a miniature son. Absolutely. But I think sometimes when we are working with people who are not necessarily such keen beans and who aren't going, oh, my God, I never thought of it that way. Oh, my God, let's go do it. Which veterinary nurses tend to be fantastically enthusiastic in that way and many vets as well. But sometimes perhaps if I'm speaking to a group of lay people or perhaps some trainers who some are are kind of some are positive reinforcement trainers they're going to want to build you know bonfires and be miniature sons for sure but sometimes we're we're preaching not to the choir we're preaching to people who who aren't aren't there or don't want to be there or aren't there yet um some vets some older school vets embers are good you know embers and sparks are are just what they need and it just plants a little seed one example that i can think of that's very current at the moment with me is the little tiny sparks that have flown off my mini son and hit my husband and um caused the change in his behavior and how he how he thinks about what he does and the practice and the work that he does so he is a veterinary surgeon and he's a specialist in surgery so he's the equivalent of a consultant he's a fantastic vet surgeon and he's always had a great eye for welfare and a great concern for welfare which we find you know most vets do but particularly those at specialist level but as a surgeon I think um, the focus is very much on the practical what can be done how can we fix it rather than the the whole animal and I, I um, don't mean to in any way disparage surgeons, but, you know, they are somewhat single minded and focused on what they're doing on the practical side of things, which is fantastic. And we need them. And we definitely, you know, don't want to stereotype in any way what our surgeons do and how they are. But I think oftentimes the rest of the care of the animal is taken um, under the wing of various other disciplines. So there might be other disciplines involved and also the nursing staff. And so he's very much um, caught some sparks and taken some embers and uh, taking them along his journey where, you know, before we would often, you know, I would try and chat about some of these things that had really inspired me or that had really um, caught fire with me. And it, it just wasn't even on his radar at that time. And it wasn't something that he was interested in. And so we didn't even really talk about it. Um, whereas now we've come kind of full circle where he's, you know, he's learned a lot. We've learned a lot together as we go along. And he's coming back to me and saying, well, actually, you know, this, this idea of fear free and low stress handling, how can we incorporate that? And he's changed how he practices. And he's also started talking to other members of of, um, staff at his practice. And they're they're now really interested in me going in and collaborating with them and doing some teaching of the staff. There's a very large staff there. There are surgeons and medics and nurses and lots of different people with lots of different disciplines, most of whom are specialists. So they're all incredibly good at what they do. But oftentimes us specialists, and I know we can get quite tunnel visioned. So seeing the big picture is quite difficult. And so he wants to try and spread a few sparks and start a few embers to get a couple of little fires going in in everybody at work. And we know that not everybody is going to take on board um, the idea of every animal at every time being pre-trained for cooperative care and having the perfect fear-free experience or low stress handling experience. We know that's not realistic at this point. Um, And we want to basically try and see how how many fires we can start with the people that that are ready to catch those embers and tend to them and look after them. So we're going to go and do some teaching in the practice and work collaboratively so that um, we do some practical teaching, we do some, you know, some theoretical teaching and um, just see if we can even change little things that people do on a daily basis and then make them normal and then make those normal things, push them a little harder, um, give them a bit more oxygen and work there. So that's a perfect example that I can think of at the moment. I think it, it depends on the individual. It depends on their goals. It depends on whether you're coming at them. And, you know, I hate to be preachy and teachy, you know, and it's great if you're preaching to the choir because the choir are all going to sing along with you. But if you have somebody who's not in the choir, you want to find a way to just get an edge, get a little, you know, just get in there and, and start just opening a conversation. And that's where Sparks can be amazing. Yeah, beautifully said. And then moving forward uh, for those that are potentially little mini fires who started as sparks, the idea is also for them, as your husband did, as you did with your husband, to 
to not necessarily want to go around creating bigger fires, but just go around and doing what fires do, <laughs> spreading sparks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, he and I are very aware now. You know, he's certainly, he's slightly more interested in behavior, but he's definitely very interested in, in low stress and patient-friendly practice now. And he's very aware that we're not going to change the whole practice. We're not going to, um, you know, make everybody suddenly be mini suns whizzing round and round. But what we want to do is just create a thought that maybe there could be a different way. Maybe we could make things better. Maybe we don't have to scruff cats all the time. You know, maybe that maybe we don't have to pin dogs down in the corner to get their blood samples. And that doesn't mean that every patient is going to have a cooperative care training plan made for them when they walk through the building for their specialist care. But it might just change the way some people, maybe not even all people, you know, there'll be people who roll their eyes to heaven and go, really? No, we just need to get it done. But even if some people can go, well, you know what, maybe we should let the cat get comfortable and work around it. Or maybe we maybe we should just give the dog a minute. Those sparks will take that. You know, that's not that's not a bonfire or a or a mini sun, but it's it's good. It's a good beginning and it's a good, a good start, you know. And and I was working with one of his clinicians recently with my own personal cat and you know, the, the default is to grab and shove her on a table and start doing the examination. And I said, you know, do you mind? She's trained for this, this relax mat and she's, she's trained for handling. Do you mind if she just sits on the desk on her relax mat and I feed her and you work around her? And he just looked so surprised. And then he went, well, it's a little unorthodox, but well, let's see what happens. And, and it was a great experience for everybody. Everybody was learning and there was no preaching. There was no deliberate setting of fires and striking of matches. It was just a case of, do you mind if we do this with my cat? And, and afterwards he was like, my goodness, that was different. That was great. But he saw it as unorthodox to begin with. Um, and then afterwards he was saying, well, you know, gosh, that was so easy. She just ate food. I just did an examination. So, you know, those little sparks, we'll take them. They're perfect for us. Yeah, I love it. And I love what you said there. Just think about the spark potentially is just creating a fought in someone else maybe there can be a better way i really like that and let's let's move on to the next question just before we do though bring people up to speed uh where are you now what are you doing now and where can people go to to find out more about you contact you and find out what you're doing Thank you, Ryan. Um, so I, uh, my little tiny weeny business is called Inspiring Pet Teaching. So my website is www.inspiringpets.com and my Facebook is the same. So it's facebook.com forward slash inspiring pets. And I love it when people join me on there because it's kind of the, the more active community. So um, currently I probably divide my time about 40% training with um canine and feline training clients and their owners so I work mostly with dogs probably a little bit with cats um, and their owners and usually as we all know it's about helping the owners learn so I, I just do you know lots of training and some behavior modification I work with I'm really lucky I have a couple of local first opinion veterinary practices that I work with pretty closely um, so under my remit as a veterinary nurse we can work together and I can help them with their clients or working in the hospital or in the practice or helping their staff understand more so a lot of my my life is actual training which I have such a passion for and I absolutely love to do and then the, probably another 40% of my working life is spent doing um, continuing professional education or continuing education as it's called in the US so lecturing teaching writing course content so I work a lot with um, international cat care at the moment which is just incredible feline education charity that is across the across the divide in the US and in the UK and worldwide it does a lot of education for vets and vet nurses as well as lay people so I work a lot with them um, I'm doing a project for fear free at the moment as well where I'm contributing some course content for their new modules which are coming up I do lecturing at events I do provision of um, online lecturing and I write um, so that's a really I really love that balance where half my you know mo almost half my life is about actual practical training and interaction with real animals and real humans and then uh, the other part is is the education side of it I travel a bit for that which is really nice and I get to meet some wonderful people but sometimes I get to sit in my pajamas with my cat on my lap like I'm doing right now um, and chat online so that's kind of cool too and of course in my role at the Karen Pryor Academy I spend a lot of time teaching and helping and supporting our students on the dog trainer professional program which I do um, throughout the course and also in person on our practical 
local workshops that we work on as well. And that's always an absolute delight to be part of and to watch trainers learn and grow. And I learn and grow as I teach every single course. Um, so that takes up a lot of my time, which I really enjoy as well. And then um, the other sort of 20 ish percent at the moment, I'm trying to shoehorn in. It needs to be it needs to be a little more balanced is a lot of study. So I'm studying for my veterinary technician specialty in behavior, which the exam will be in October. And then I'm also um, preparing, as, as you mentioned, for my, my top up year of my BSc degree. So I'm trying to study a lot. And, and I really love that side of it as well, because everything I learn, I get, you know, I get more sparks and more embers and I get to learn a little bit more about, oh, gosh, I should do that better. And oh, I never knew that. And, oh. So the study kind of dovetails into the practical work that I'm doing, um, both as a, as a, a teacher and as a trainer. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of how I how I spend my professional life. And then the rest of the time, I'm just adoring my beautiful dog and my lovely cat and my sheep and my chickens and living in the national park with my husband and just uh, trying to find some time for life as well. <laughs> Sounds like you're burning bright there, wee little son. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all of that, Linda. We're going to sh- put some links in the podcast right up for you listening so you can go and easily uh, find all of the Facebook and websites that Linda just mentioned. We're going to move on now. We're going to go pretty broad here, and then we're going to zone in on a couple of different areas as we move forward in the conversation. So let's build on a little bit of what you're doing at the moment, Linda, one of your main focuses being oncology. Can you just explain for anyone that might not know, what is oncology and and how are you involved? Thank you, Ryan. So yeah, oncology basically means the study of cancer. So I'm a specialist cancer nurse, and I started doing that in about 2006, and then it was 2009 that I, I got my veterinary technician specialty. So I helped to set up and, and run the cancer service in Edinburgh um, at the vet school under the, the fantastic guidance of Professor Argyle, who'd come fresh from Colorado, which is one of the, the world leading places for veterinary oncology. And uh, the, the field of veterinary oncology has grown so much over the last 15 to 20 years. So, you know, when, when I first started as a trainee veterinary nurse in the west of Ireland, and it was, I, oh gosh, I remember this so clearly. It was my second day in the practice. And this little old dog came in with an elderly gentleman and they pottered in together. And this dog had a huge mass, huge lump on the side of his face, pretty much half of, half the sides of his head was attached to one side of his face. And they pottered in to see the, the um, senior vet at the time. And 10 minutes later, he came out just holding the collar and the lead, which he shoved into his pocket and came to pay his bill. And off he went out the door. And I went in and I said to Seamus, what on earth happened? Where's his dog? So naive. Um, and he said, oh, no, it was cancer. It was cancer. And I went, yeah. And and he said, well, it's cancer. We, we put the dog to sleep. So this poor guy got 10 minutes and his dog was dead. And there was no explanation of what could or should have been done, what diagnostics could have been offered. And in those days, it was very different. There weren't that many diagnostics and treatments that we could offer, certainly not in the West of Ireland in a tiny little first opinion practice, but there was no conversation about it. And the guy went out trying to be incredibly brave as he paid his bill and shoved his lead and his collar in his pocket and toddled out probably to his home where he lived alone and had no dog anymore. And that was, you know, really startling for me that a life could end so quickly and that it was just, well, it's cancer. That's the end of that. You know, there's nothing we can do. There's no conversation to be had to working in this state-of-the-art hospital where we had a dedicated service with board-certified clinicians and a residency program and specialist nurses and, a, you know, a radiotherapy suite and CTs and MRIs and chemotherapy protocols and all of the stuff that we would be doing for human patients. It was a world away, you know, 10, 15 years later. And looking back on that poor little old dog and little old man together, you know, again, it's one of those things where you think, oh, my God, how did that happen? How did somebody not hold his hand and talk to him and say it's okay to cry, even that, you know, because grief cancelling is something I've been hugely involved with over the years as well. So my involvement was, was with the cancer service and 
we were aiming and still are, you know, now I, I teach a lot on oncology. I don't do as much clinical stuff, but I do still go into practice and do um, kind of practical tutorials for nurses. In fact, I've got one coming up in the next couple of weeks where I'm going to go in and talk to them about quality of life and welfare and how to set up clinics for our patients, outpatient clinics, and also chemotherapy safety, as well as um, ensuring that our animals have great quality of life on their chemotherapy and their treatments. And that's something that's really struck me when I've been working in the specialist clinic is that there's a lot we can do for our patients. You know, if your dog has a tumor on his head, by all means, we can cut off his head. There he is, he's cured, but we have no dog. So what we need to, to have is that balance between quality of life and welfare and that dog having the best possible quality of life, however you want to define that as possible with the caveat that we may not have the longevity. So in human ca uh, cancer therapy, the aim is always cure. Whereas in veterinary oncology, the aim is not necessarily cure. It's the aim to make every day as good a day as it can possibly be for this dog and for this owner and to preserve the human animal bond and to preserve that quality of life that they have together. And so when we're treating them, we don't always go in all guns blazing and say, yeah, let's chop his head off. That'll get rid of the tumor. We we will go in and we will do the minimum necessary to achieve what we need to achieve so that that dog or cat can have the best quality of life rather than thinking about all the days it might have. All the days have to be good. So we might use two thirds of the doses of chemotherapy that humans would use. And we, d we don't go full on making sure that they have horrible, horrible side effects from the chemo, but they're going to live. Um, we don't aim for that. It's the opposite. We, we give the minimum amount of chemotherapy necessary to ensure that the cancer is under control and they have the best possible quality of life alongside it. And we rarely see side effects from that. And it's the same with radiotherapy. So we, we're aiming for the minimum necessary treatment to ensure the best possible health alongside the quality of life as well. And, and a lot of it is about owner education because many, many owners, you know, cancer is a really sensitive topic. Everybody knows somebody who suffered from cancer. Many people have lost friends and relatives to cancer and often when they hear a diagnosis of cancer in their dog or their cat it's instantly devastating because there is you know there's such a it's a scary concept you know we're all very very frightened of that concept so oftentimes it's about saying you know things are different for oncology patients when we treat them we're not aiming to have a sick patient that might live we're aiming to have minimal treatment minimal time in hospital every day is a good day but with the caveat that it's not going to be a natural lifespan in many, many cases, you know, if we can cure them, that's amazing. But very often it's management of that tumour. So it's about helping owners understand huge amount of it is about counselling, you know, about, yeah, I realise that this is your little dog that was your husband's dog that you lost to cancer last year. And he's your last link to your husband. And now he's got cancer, too. And just trying to work through that with them and, and work on the grief counselling side of things as well. So it's it's a very diverse role for a veterinary nurse who's, who's involved. There's a huge amount of clinical work. And there's a huge amount of um, looking after the quality of life and welfare of that animal, which is how it dovetails so beautifully into behaviour work, looking after the owner, being able to work across lots of different disciplines, being able to communicate and liaise with first opinion vets as well as the specialist vets so that you're you're building a team around that animal. So it's really diverse. It's incredibly rewarding. Um, and, you know, I remember when I got the job, everybody else was going, why would you want it? It's all sick, dying animals and it's misery and they're all going to die and oh, it's horrible. Um, but in reality, actually, if we're doing our jobs properly, we're creating the best possible quality of life that we can. We're buying time um, to give the, the human and the animals some, some quality time together. And we don't have sick patients. You know, we, we have well patients or we're intervening and we're doing something quick because every day has to be a good day. So I'm super passionate about it and I love it. And I think it's an incredibly rewarding thing and it's grown. It's grown so much. You know, when I used to go and speak on veterinary oncology to nurses and to vets. I might have 10 or 20 people in the audience. And now it's become a mainstream discipline. And I can expect full houses when I go and talk because I know that everybody wants to know more because cancer is common and many animals are living to old age. So it's, you know, it's a disease mainly of old age. So we know that just like people, cancer being this disease of old age, up to one in four animals are going to, to have cancer and perhaps die from cancer. So it's much more common and the discipline has advanced so much and we have a lot more interest in it now as well. Yeah, absolutely one for what you're doing. Thank you. 
on behalf of dogs <laughs> and people. <laughs> uh, I think I rambled on a little bit too much there, didn't I? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I mean, it's such a sad topic. I mean, that once again, you, you do tell a good story, Linda, and I, when you're talking about that old man at the start putting his leash and his collar in his pocket and leaving <laughs> to his house, you know, that I mean, that's incredibly sad, and it's rational, I think, for your friends to be like, Linda, let, let's just think about this. <laughs> Is that what you want to be doing with your life? Um, so that's why I say thank you, because thank you. <laughs> that's... Oh, thank you. <laughs> so so bring us now to the application of clicker training with, in this setting. Um, we'll, we'll move, I really want to move on to uh, your, your inputs and offerings with regards to clicker trainer, training in the hospital setting in general. But maybe let's start here. What kind of behavioural interventions do you include with people in this position? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And so for me, all patients, we should be seeing the big picture. We should be having a holistic approach. And by holistic, I don't mean that in a kind of airy fairy way. I mean, as in seeing the whole animal and treating the whole animal. And that includes their emotional health and their behavioral welfare, as well as their clinical um, needs. Everything needs to be part of that package. And I think every patient needs to have that considered at all times, both in the hospital and in the home setting and in their relationship with their humans. That's that goes without saying for me. It's it's just something that you know it's it should be our baseline. It's not yet, but we're getting there. But with oncology patients, for me, I know I'm biased, but for me, I think they're they're special. They're super super special, and they deserve a lot of you know whatever we can give them. We need to give more. They deserve everything they get when it comes to to the good stuff. Um, and so the things that you know we work with with our with our oncology patients, and this goes as well for elderly patients or any patients suffering from chronic diseases, whose days might be limited and who we're battling to give the best possible quality of life to, but every day being a good day. But particularly for my oncology patients, we want to think first of all about the treatment side of things. What's the borrow and payback? So what are we taking from this animal and what's this animal going to gain, for example, by coming into hospital for three days and having a massive surgery, but then it's cured and it goes home for the rest of its life and it lives out a normal life. Or if it's coming in once a week to have chemotherapy treatment and we've got a sick to nine month prognosis that has to be worth it for that animal. So, you know, there's lots of things that that I would aim to do with a patient that's coming in a lot for a lot of treatments and that we're borrowing a lot from so that we want to try and pay that patient back. So I will work with owners on one level to, to think about doing fun things. So teaching them, a lot of owners don't really know how to play with their animals or certainly sometimes when the animals have cancer, they're afraid. They're afraid, oh, what if I hurt him? What if I break him? What if that's too much for him? So teaching them how to play and interact in a way that's physically and emotionally appropriate for that particular animal and giving them permission to go go do things that are, that are fun together. Go to the beach, play tug, whatever it is that you used to do with that dog and that that dog always loved. Let's find a way to make that work around his new situation. Um, And also things like social inclusion, again, because many owners will find that they're scared. They want to wrap their dog or their cat up in cotton wool. They want to let them rest. But actually, you know, that that animal probably needs some kind of social inclusion. So just thinking about where we position their resources in the home so that they can rest, but then they can come and to be with the family too. And they can go on a trip to the beach or a day out or go shopping or whatever it is, you know, that's socially inclusive or just spending some time sitting beside them doing nothing. So that kind of stuff, you know, for me, I want to build as a baseline. Um, But I also like to think about we can use clicker training for mental stimulation just to do fun things. So oftentimes, you know, we would say, well, you know, he's just had this big surgery and we're sending him home and he's on all kinds of painkillers and he's on all kinds of medication and you have to confine him. And the owner is going, oh, my goodness, this is all totally overwhelming. Um, And so we say, well, you know what, let's teach him a trick. And so you teach them to lift a paw or to wag a tail just by capturing and and shaping a little bit or to, you know, look left, look right. It's something super stupid and super simple. And they come back in in a week's time and they're not telling you how that dog is and how the recovery from surgery has been or how he's done with his chemotherapy. They're going, hey, look, 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 watch, he can wave. And so for them, that's a really big deal that they've really enjoyed together. So it's a bonding experience. It reminds them how clever and special they're their dog or their cat was and it still is um (coughs) excuse me 
and it's providing mental stimulation and fun and enrichment for that animal and it's taking the mind off cancer and you know because what can happen is the, the animal just ends up being a cancer patient and that's all anybody can think about or talk about so giving just a silly trick to teach is, is super cool we can also use clicker training for teaching cooperative care so for husbandry and handling um you know how we how we handle these animals how we move them so we could for example have them offering a limb for their weekly blood sample or offering a sit and a target your chin to your tummy so that you've got your you're in a sit position with your chin up targeting the nurse's tummy and then you get your blood sample taken so there are loads of different cooperative um procedures that we can train for we can train them to enjoy and to tolerate passive handling as well um, so that is something that again will massively benefit the patient and improve welfare as well as being a lovely thing for owners to do together with their patient um, and we can do things like training for physiotherapy mm -hmm. so teaching them stretches or teaching them you know how to move in a more normal natural way being a little bit more body aware and thinking about proprioception so we can use it for that type of thing so it's an awful lot nicer if you can ask the dog or the cat to move in a particular position rather than grabbing that limb and stretching it or grabbing that neg and twisting it which is what we used to do in the bad old days with the spinal patients we would just manipulate them whereas how about we teach them that they can manipulate their own bodies in a way that they feel safe and comfortable to do and then shape for more um, so a lot of that is stuff that we will work with and teach and as well, teaching enabling procedures. So sometimes if an animal has had a surgery and they are no longer as physically able to do what they used to do, we might teach the owners how to teach their dog or their cat to use a ramp or to use a set of steps with confidence so that they can still get up to that windowsill and watch the world go by or still get in the car because they love going for a car ride. So there's a ton of cool stuff that we can train with clicker training that builds confidence and ability, not just in the in the patient be that a cat or a dog and cats of course we all know just love training and are perfectly brilliant at training as much as dogs are um, to to build their confidence and ability and also to build that owner's confidence and ability in in what their pet can do rather than worrying about what they can't do and constantly thinking about cancer um, so there's a ton of different stuff that we get going on that can improve welfare and maintain and build quality of life and your cat agrees with you <laughs> My cat has just brought in a live shrew, which she is now chasing around the landing. And I'm very sorry, but there's nothing I can do about it. So Sorry, everyone. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> My cat's uh, <laughs> fast out sleeping, but they, they also like to talk a lot uh, mm. at <laughs> inappropriate times. So I think everyone that's listening to the podcast now wants to come to clinics that you're involved with, <laughs> but <laughs> they don't all live in the vicinity of you. Um, so maybe we can help give some ideas to people who want to implement things like this and want to take it to their vets and to their vet visits, um, but their vets might not necessarily have experience with the things that you've been talking about. Uh, and slash or might not be as open to the ideas. What what advice can you give these people? Yeah, that's wonderful. And this is where our sparks come in, isn't it? It's about, you know, and, and I run a, a class at the moment of, you know, my, my incredible clients. They're just wonderful. I run some classes at the moment and they, I always have the same group of people coming back to the same three classes for years and they always trust me. I always say to them, what do you want to do? And they always go, I don't know, whatever you want. So I always get to make up what we teach. And this term we're doing cooperative care only. And so they rock up to class expecting us to be doing tribal or scent work or tricks and I go we're going to do cooperative vet care and they're going huh what <laughs> and I'm going well it's just tricks really it's just tricks um, and bless them they've come with me on it they're into it and they're loving it and so we're teaching all kinds of things like offering paws and um you know, the ability of animals to say no, reading that body language um, so that animals can can say, hang on a minute, I need a moment or having say yes or say no positions for animals. And we're also teaching all about, you know, offer your back foot, hold it in my hand. Are you cool with the clippers clipping that back foot? Let me look at your bum, all this sort of stuff. And so my, my owners, my clients are learning this in their classes. And then they're coming in three, four or five weeks later going, I was worried about this, Linda. I was worried, but, you know, he needed his back 
vaccination and we had to go in. And so I just showed my vet what we were doing. I showed him that he has a yes and a no behavior. And so if he says no, we all stop and we all back off and everybody takes a breath. And then we wait for him to say yes again. Or I showed him that, you know, you want to clip those nails. Don't force it. Don't grab his foot. Just ask. He knows what to do. And they were amazed that their vets were kind of going, oh, just like my, my dermatologist when I took Olive in for her examination. It's a little unorthodox, but they're going with it. And, and these are the little sparks that are flying. It's, it's about individual people taking their individual ideas or their individual little pieces that they've learned and saying, how about we try it this way? Is this OK? Do you mind? Let me show you. So that's one way. Just, you know, everybody showing everybody and building that knowledge and that confidence in the fact that Mm -hmm. positive reinforcement works. Low stress works. We don't need to grab animals and do things to them. And, you know, if we can have owners going into vet clinics doing that day after day, one at a time, one vet, one owner, one dog, one cat at a time, they're fantastic little sparks that are going to go out into the world. Um, I think from a trainer's point of view, Historically, for a long time, there tends to be, certainly in my experience and a lot of people I speak to, the experience is that trainers think that vets have no clue about behavior. Fair enough. Vets and veterinary nurses, we we don't get taught very much about behavior at all. And we have very little in terms of evidence base as to what we should be doing. And that's changing. And the, the new modern universities are now trying to include more. It's still tiny compared with everything else they do. But vets and nurses just generally, particularly those of my generation, and and older it was never taught Um, and you know the only thing I got taught about in in veterinary nursing is how to restrain animals so that they can't move you know that was about my behavioral knowledge and how to use a slip lead properly Um, so they're just you know oftentimes vets and nurses do not have the knowledge therefore they do not have the confidence to know what to do or how to lead that conversation or start that conversation and they sometimes haven't even heard of this idea of you know fear free for example It's, it's just not even on their radar are because it's just not something they've ever done. So I think just trainers learning that vets are people too, veterinary nurses are people too. In the in the fantastic words of, of Yak Pansep, under the hat, we're all the same. You know, we we all are just doing our best for animals and we we all have the same goals. So oftentimes it's just a matter of learning to communicate in a way that allows everybody to help each other rather than going in there being super judgmental and going, well, you know, what do you know about behavior? Or conversely, the veterinary profession going, well, I have no idea who this trainer is. I don't know what their qualifications are because it's an unregulated industry. So vets and nurses are being trained only, only evidence-based medicine at all times. So from a training point of view our responsibility is to show the evidence of what are your qualifications what are your professional memberships what are your ethics who who are you answerable to so that we're, we're building vet nurses confidence in the evidence base and the knowledge and the ethics of the trainers that they're working with so building relationships and learning to communicate remembering that under the hat we're all the same we're all just doing our best and we're all just people and we might be brilliant at one thing but the other is a little hazy so just you know again being kind to each other and, and and learning to to build those relationships everybody's going to benefit everybody we're all learning from each other all the time and the more we can do that the better it's going to be for the world i think anyway um planning ahead is a wonderful thing so very often when i'm working with a vet mm-hmm. i'm lucky in that i have two or three practices that i work regularly with and they know me so i can ring them up and go you know this dog can we do this what do you think about that so we're not just rocking up and, and doing our best we're, we're sending an email in advance and saying i'm bringing my cat in or I'm bringing this client's dog in and we're going to work together and this is what I'd like to do. How does that fit around what you need to do? How can we make this work together so that we're making a plan before we even start? Be that a phone call or an email or dropping in or even often if I rock up with a client, I'll often say to the client, you know, stay in the car. I'm just going to quickly pop in, check what's going on in the clinic, check the guys are happy um, so that we're reaching out to each other and working in the best way that we can before we even start. We've got a plan and we know what to expect from each other rather than having a trainer rocking up with a dog into the clinic and going right we're doing it this way or the vet going no we're not doing it that way or whatever whichever way around you want to put that because that can be intimidating and it can immediately cause a little bit of conflict 
So instead, we want to be clear and open and learn to communicate, learn to be as evidence based as possible. And if we can go in there as trainers with, with some kind of evidence for what we're doing, we as veterinary professionals, and when I say we, it's always very confusing with me because it's we as veterinary nurses and we as trainers. <laughs> so we as veterinary professionals very much appreciate any kind of evidence that, that can be brought to the table as well. Um, and so it's just a case of, I think, just sending out those sparks, letting people understand that we all want to help, you know, and I think sometimes egos can get in the way. Sometimes expectations based on past experiences can get in the way. Whereas we want to have open minds and open hearts and, and think, right, well, everybody wants the same thing here. How can we get there together? And, and just building that communication between owners and vets and, and trainers and nurses and everybody's part of that team, including the animal. So building a relationship, learning to communicate, starting with the same goal that we all want the same thing here. And you shared a little spark with me there. I loved it. Uh, Chuck Panskip, I've said that horribly, <laughs> said, under the hat, we are all the same. Can you just, for people that are listening that potentially don't understand that metaphor. Can you just unpack that a little bit for us before we move on? Yeah, I, I love that. And thanks so much, Ryan. You're so brilliant at potting all this rambling that I'm doing. You're just brilliant <laughs> at going, so this, this and this. And I'm like, yeah, why can not I pot it like that? I'll send you <laughs> so a picture brilliant. of Thank my you. piece of paper afterwards. <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense to anyone but me. <laughs> Thank you. So I think a lot of times in the view of owners and very many paraprofessionals who are not veterinary professionals, we tend to see the vets as the gods. You know, they know everything. They're the champions of welfare. We have to do everything the vet says. Yeah, of course, in, in many ways, that is that is true. They are amazing. Um, and vets are incredible. And I love working with vets as part of the team. But I think sometimes it can be intimidating or we can expect too much of them or we can think that they are omniscient and all powerful, whereas actually they're just people. They're still naked under their Clothes. They still, you know, they still worry about things. They still have concerns. And, you know, I know so many vets in, in veterinary referral who are specialists in their field, in general practice, who are good at lots of things, but are not specialists. And every one of them, you know, I was speaking to my friend the other day, she's a specialist in rabbit medicine. And she was worrying and saying, you know, I'm on the on-call rotor. I often have to see animals that are not rabbits. And I really hate, hate doing surgery. I really hate doing orthopedic surgery. I don't know enough about it. I don't feel confident in that. Whereas we would look at her from the outside and go, she's such an amazing vet. She's so good at surgery. She's so good at everything. Whereas she's confiding to me, all I really know about is rabbits. If you ask me about, you know, a dog with a medical condition or a dog with an orthopedic condition, which is bones and muscles, I don't know what to tell people. I have to make up an excuse and go out and look something up um, or I have to defer to a colleague. And so I think sometimes we need to remember that vets are only humans. People are only humans. Trainers are only humans. Dogs and cats are only human. You know, we're, we're all we're all the same. We all have worries. We all have fears. We all have concerns. But, you know, underneath it all, certainly in the in the professions that I'm talking about with our veterinary um, professionals and veterinary staff, our training and behavior professionals and our owners, everybody has the same goal in mind, which is to, to care for that animal. Whereas we might all have concerns or reservations or worries or um, huge gaps in our knowledge and not know what to say and not know what to do about it. But I think if we all can learn to empathize and learn to realize that, no, you're not, you don't know everything, neither do I. Here's what I know. Here's what you know. How can we make that work together um, because ultimately we are all the same you know when when I have a problem with one of my animals at home and my husband's super specialist is exactly the same you know when Evie had a poorly eye my little dog a couple of weeks ago we're both in meltdown neither of us know what to do you know we're both specialists in our field and we're both going oh my god she's got a sore eye oh no she's on paper what are we gonna do I don't know oh no we're we're just people we're just people worrying about the dog that we love um so we don't know everything, and especially when it comes to having emotional involvement in the animal. <laughs> so, yeah, we're all the same and we shouldn't be intimidated and we shouldn't be worried and we shouldn't think anybody is better than anybody else or worse than anybody else. We're all we're all equal. And I think if we take that attitude that we're all everybody has something valuable to bring and everybody has worries and concerns, but they're working together. We all have something valuable to bring. And under the hat, we are all the same. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. I'm, I'm running around like crazy here, Linda. I'm just putting fires out everywhere because there's sparks just flying all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, thank you very much for sharing all of that. I know that people listening to the show, this is all going to be super beneficial. Thank you for everything so far, Linda. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm having a ball. <laughs> I hope I'm not rambling on too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's all it's all sparks. They're just flying left, right, up, down, under, over. It's great. Moving forward, we're going to go into one of my favorite parts of the show. I am a big geek when it comes to stories. So I was wondering if at this junction you could share with me and the listeners two or three stories from your experience, two or three more stories, I should say, from your experience training and working with animals so far and some of the important lessons that these stories have taught you. Oh, that's I love that question. And that gives me a, a real lovely opportunity to reminisce about, you know, animals that I've worked with over the years. And so one of them that always springs to mind, and this is a dog who actually he travels everywhere with me on every lecture I ever do on oncology and on, you know, good quality of life, is Scruble. And Scruble was a border collie. He came to us, to the cancer service. He was one of, I think he was about the third patient I ever cared for in the cancer service. So he came to us very, very early on in my in my time learning about all of this stuff. And he was, he had lymphoma, which is a horrible cancer, which spreads throughout the body, takes over the bone marrow and the lymph nodes and the blood system um, and is guaranteed that it is going to, to be the cause of death of, of these dogs, unfortunately. He came to us at the age of three, and that's really tragic when we see that because mostly, as I said, cancer is a disease of old age. And so when we see babies, it really breaks our hearts. And so this boy came into us at the age of three years old, and he had um, gastrointestinal lymphoma, which is in the gut. Very, very bad prognosis. So we started his cancer therapy and we got him going. And his mom is actually a member of the Association of Pet Dog Trainers UK. She's a great trainer herself. She's She was really into behavior and training when I first met her. She was, again, one of these inspirational figures. And she continued on with his life. She was kind of like, cancer, schmancer. That's OK. We're going to continue having a life. So he would come in for his treatment once a week. And he was given a kind of nine-month-ish prognosis if he was very, very lucky, maybe six months. Um, so throughout his cancer treatment, she continued to do his training. So he was an agility collie. He was a fly ball collie. And um, so he was already in training for, he'd won a place at Crufts for both of these things. And he was already in training when his diagnosis was made. And she was kind of like, you know, this isn't going to stop us. We want to keep this going. And I was like, yeah, that's amazing because we want to keep the quality of life going. So we tried to maintain that training routine as much as we could around his cancer treatment. And um, I remember what, I think it was about two thirds of the way through his cancer protocol. We had to skip a week. We had to stop treatment and we had to skip a week because he was going to Crufts. So we all gathered around the television on that day. Everybody at the vet clinic, all of his all of his care team were gathered around watching him on telly, winning the fly ball and coming really high up in the agility competition because his mom carried on with that, you know, clicker training, positive reinforcement training, maintaining that routine, doing all of these incredible things that she'd always done with him, working around his cancer therapy. And she continued to go on and train with him. And, and he won, which was just extraordinary and just so beautiful and such a legend lesson for us that you can have cancer and have a life. And Scribble actually broke all the records and proved everybody wrong. And we always say in veterinary oncology, we love it when we're wrong. Um, and he beat the odds somehow. Somehow, we, we still don't know. We definitely had a right diagnosis. We, we biopsied everything again because we thought, have we got the diagnosis wrong? But he went on and on and on. And he went back and back and back to Crofts year after year. And I lost touch with his mum when I left the school. And um, I met her last year at a, a Karen overall behaviour event we just happened to bump into each other and she tapped me on the shoulder and went remember me and I went oh my goodness and she told me that she had lost Scruble at the age of 13 years old and that he went on to be the most incredible teacher to all of her subsequent generations of dog and many other dogs that she's worked with and so he not only survived cancer and lived to a natural old age, but his positive reinforcement training was the making of him. Who knows? Maybe that was the reason he did so brilliantly throughout his life. Um, and and they went on and did wonderful things together. And and I've, I take him everywhere with me in my heart and on my slides so that we can we can really think, you know, that there's so much we can do concurrently to, to help animals and, and build their lives um, in a positive way around their treatment as well. 
So he's he's amazing, old screwball. Um, and the other the other girl that I would like to to mention today is my own cat, Ninja, um, Nini for short. She came to me as a day old kitten on my first day as a trainee nurse in the west of Ireland in my little tiny practice in Galway, and she was with me for fourteen years, and I adored her. But she was a little bit um, special in how she behaved and her needs and 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 what what we did with her because she was the typical hand raised kitten so i'd had her from one day old i knew absolutely nothing about how to raise a hand raised kitten in those days now again i would do such a better job of helping her to learn to feel comfortable and safe and not be fearful and not be frustrated in the world but i didn't know then and so she was always a little bit fragile and special um but she was labeled by everybody as a bad cat. You know, she couldn't tolerate strangers. My dad still talks about her as the horrible cat because he couldn't get upstairs. She would stand at the top and swipe at him and hiss at him. And on a couple of occasions, she had to be hospitalized because she ingested a foreign body. At one point, she ate a peach stone and that got stuck in her gut. She had to go to hospital. And normally she would be kept in intensive care for two or three days and then sent down to the ward and then discharged when she was better. And within about two hours, of her recovering from her general anaesthetic after her surgery, the ICU people were coming to me and saying, you have to take her home. She can't stay here. And she'd given two of the clinicians black eyes. They couldn't manage her. They couldn't medicate her. They couldn't get near her to manage her drip in her arm. Um, And she was just spitting and flying at the kennel and nobody could get within two or three meters of where she was living. So I had to go get her and take her home and nurse her at home. So this is her background and this is where she came from. She was so fearful. She was laboring labeled as a bad cat, labeled as an aggressive cat, labeled as an impossible, difficult, horrible cat by everybody. But she adored her mama. And um, over the years, she developed heart failure and she had to have four different types of medications twice a day. And the clinician that I worked with went, you know, Linda, I think probably the kindest thing is to put her to sleep because this is such a difficult cat. You're not going to be able to medicate her. She's just too aggressive. And so, again, this is where cat training started with me. We we started working on that. We started on teaching her to calmly accept being handled, to calmly accept having her medication. And nowadays, sadly, again, I lost her within three weeks of losing Luca, which was absolutely horrendous. Um, so sadly gone, my little girl. But now I take videos of her around with me, of showing me, calling her to the station where she had her tablets, holding her just very, very gently, one finger under her chin to administer her oral medication four times twice a day giving her a treat and then playing a little game with her and this was this horrible unmanageable cat she wasn't a bad cat of course she was just absolutely terrified and she taught me that working around the animal's needs (coughs) and working with whatever the animal gives you and helping them to, to come to a place of safety and security we can achieve amazing things and we even got to the point where we were training cooperative care procedures with her for a cat that couldn't be handled and couldn't be touched and should have been euthanized because we couldn't medicate her um, to having managing this disease that she lived with for the the last three and a half years of her life in a completely stress-free way. Um, So there are my two that I've chosen to chat about. I could tell you about hundreds of my animals that I've worked with over the years, but they're the two that I've chosen to pick out for today, the amazing teachers. Wonderful stories. And I've got a lot of questions and (laughs) <laughs> tangents we could go off on but I'm also conscious of the time um, yeah. we do like to share media in the podcast right up I don't know if you can share a photo of Screwball uh, and your video of the, your cooperative care of the cat is that possible and 100% feel free to say no yes it is yes it is I would love to do that wonderful so if you listening want to see Screwball in all Screwballs I was like saying Screwball in all Screw, <laughs> great name where did the name Screwball come from I have no idea, but I love it too. (laughs) Uh, And cat training, absolutely love cat training. And I know it's something that Animal Training Academy members are really passionate about. I've got a lot of cat trainers at the moment very active in their training activities with their cats, including myself. So absolutely uh, be honoured to to see what you did. And and very sorry to hear about uh, your losses and very close to to each other as well. very sad. I know. Thank you. It was nearly four years ago this week, actually. And it's still, oh, we just love them so much, don't we? And they make such an impression on our heart. 
Oh. Always value them. Of course. Um, and yeah, just once again, just condolences on that. It's always not nice to hear those. St- we we learn so much from them at the same time, don't we? So their legacy Absolutely. is living on and it's living on For right sure. Now. For sure. The legacy is there and they give so much, they teach so much. And, uh, you know, it's so sad that their lives are just that much shorter than ours. And I just hope that this hasn't been too much of a depressing podcast <laughs> talking about all these cancer patients and then my personal losses. But, you know, I think we need to celebrate these lives and we need to remember them and we need to honour them and value them and keep them with us forever and take the lessons that they teach us and, and remember the joy that we that we have with these animals and that they bring us and and um, that we share with them. And I think we should. For me, it's uplifting to to remember and and to to enjoy the joy that we shared for sure. And their sparks are still being shed, even though they're not physically with us anymore. On another sad note, we are nearly at the end, Linda. But that's okay because we have one more question, and I absolutely love this one as well, Linda. I'd like you to take us all into the future now and share with us what you would like to see happen over the next five to ten years in the animal training world. Oh, that's a chunky one, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Um, There are so many things, and I think it's really tricky to pick out a couple. But for me, personally, for what I do and, and how I work, I would love to see more veterinary trainer owner pet collaboration and communication because I think that's going to benefit us all so I want us to come together and to work together and to see the advantage in that and to see how much we can all help each other and learn from each other so that's a biggie for me I would love to see more of that and I think we're we've got a couple of feet on the ladder as we head up that ladder towards the dizzy heights of being mini suns Um, so I think that's a really big one Um, I would like to see more of us working with animals. So I think sometimes, particularly, certainly for me, when I started out as a baby trainer and I got my memo from Karen, it was all about, wow, look what I can make the dog do. Oh, cool. Look what I trained him. I'm so clever. I'm so smart. Um, And the more, the older I get, the more savvy I get, the more animals that teach me things, the more I realize is the animals are teaching us. We need to let go of our egos. It's not about us. So I want to see training for welfare, training for quality of life, training for improvement improved human animal relationships, training for animals to be successful and happy within their homes. So you and I were speaking a tiny bit about this before we came on air about, you know, things that we don't bother training for because we don't care. You don't care about your cat lying upside down on your desk when you're trying to work. I don't care about my dog jumping up on somebody because she's excited to see them. Whereas many people would say, oh, you should you should train your cat to station when you're working. You should train your dog four on the floor when a visitor comes. I don't really care about that stuff. I care about my animal having a happy life and being confident and being happy to try new things. Yeah, of course, I don't want a crazy out of control dog that's socially obnoxious for everybody on the planet. But if it's relatively innocuous things, that is an expression of happiness and joy. I don't care. I'm not training for that. What I am going to train for is how for how our dogs can be successful in their lives with us. Because in, in the words of Susan Suzanne Clothier, our dogs are not volunteers and no pet. Our pets are not volunteers. They're conscripts. So it's up to us to make sure they have the best possible life in our care that's where I want to see training going. Us working with empathy and consideration, building skills for life in what we train with our animals, things that matter to the animal um, and uh, and things that make their lives better in our world and making sure it's all about them, not about us. So that's how I would like this to be in the future. And I think we're getting things that make it better for them in our world. Love it. Yeah. And I'm in the process now of making a big combination of everyone's answers to that question because I've been asking it now for becoming on three years nearly <laughs> so I'm going to be able to start measuring this stuff soon and um, it's going to be uh, I'm going to put a, be putting a video together over the coming while of all these answers so really excited about being able to add your contribution to that as well touch wood that I actually finish doing that because it's <laughs> it's going to get bigger every month you can make a research paper out of that, couldn't you? I think we what could. do trainers think is the most important thing? Well, <laughs> we've got a conference coming up and it's called Shaping the Future. And I thought, how better to define the future for everyone at that conference then? Fantastic. I love that. <laughs> hey, thank you for sharing everything today, Linda. Before we do wrap up, just remind everyone listening 
please, where they can go to find out more about you, what you're up to, and how they can get involved. Oh, thank you so much, Brian. So it's www.inspiringpets.com or it's facebook.com forward slash inspiring pets. And I would love to, to make contact with anyone that wants to chat, anybody that wants to collaborate. I'm, I'm up for it. We're all learning all the time. And uh, yeah, lovely to hear from new people and, and learn new things from each other and with each other. So thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. And we will, as mentioned, link to all of that in the show notes next to Screwball. So you can come in there <laughs> nice and easy and find it. Hey, Linda, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show today and to catch up with me a month ago and to send messages back and forth uh, in the interim between those two events. So we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much for having me. I've absolutely loved it. And um, yeah, it's just a pleasure and an honor. So thank you. And it's your first podcast, you were saying. So absolute honor to be able to be the vehicle to get your knowledge and your experience out there. Oh, thank you. Yes, I've never done a podcast before and it's been super, super fun. And um, yeah, I, I just hope that somebody finds some little spark of useful or interesting stuff there. So, um, And I, I love listening to your podcast and you've had so many amazing people on and it's just a, a privilege to be part of it. And it's a, it's a fantastic project that you're doing with Animal Training Academy. So thank you hugely. Thank you so much, Linda. There's some really nice things you just said. They make me feel all special. <laughs> We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice, rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of the episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media, media platform for Bahamian geeks. There's something there for absolutely everyone and we're looking forward to having you join the tribe. That's it for this episode though. We will wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for listening and you will hear from us again soon. <laughs> <laughs>